Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Entrepreneurship, Entrepreneurship Live. Thank you for coming. My name is Amanda Golden. I'm the program manager in the Herb Kelleher Center for Entrepreneurship, and we're so excited that you're here to join us this evening to hear more from Tim League. Um, Throughout the evening, you will have the opportunity to submit questions to Tim. Um, you can go to sli.do and enter the code C291 to submit your questions, and we will be incorporating some of the audience questions as we go through the Q&A portion of this evening. It is now my pleasure to introduce Tim League. Tim graduated from Rice University in 1992 with degrees in mechanical engineering and art and art history. After two years working for Shell Oil Company in Bakersfield, California, he left engineering and opened up his first movie theater. In 1997, Tim started Alamo Drafthouse Cinema, where he currently serves as the CEO. Tim is also the founder of the film distribution company Drafthouse Films, the co-founder of genre film festival Fantastic Fest, the co-founder entertainment merchandise entity Mondo and the co-founder of film distribution and production company Neon. Please help me give a big Longhorn welcome to Tim League here to the 40 Acres. Hello everybody. Can you, can you hear me okay? I strapped on a microphone back there. I'm not sure if it totally works but I think it does. Um, and I've got this. I'm going to see if this advances the slides. Um, all right, here we go. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my past. Um, this is Isaac Asimov, uh, acclaimed science fiction author. And that's the first computer that I bought uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, I had a paper route, and uh, it cost me $4,000 to buy that machine. And um, uh, it seems absurd at this point, um, but that that was that was that was my interest. That's what I was into in uh, uh, middle school and high school. I thought for sure I was going to be a computer programmer for life. And had I possibly pursued that, I might not have um, I might not have opened the Alamo Draft House. Uh, I, I I can't tell you why, but at some point by the time I was a freshman at Rice, I decided to become a mechanical engineer. And I'm not casting any shade on the, the career of mechanical engineering, uh, but it turned out it wasn't for me. This is me taking a selfie out in the oil field uh, when I was a sophomore in college. I worked for Shell uh, uh, as an intern my sophomore year and junior year, and they offered me a job uh, because I was a pretty damn good intern, apparently. But uh, during, during the, the, the sophomore and junior year internship, and by the time I graduated, I had lost the fire in my belly uh, for mechanical engineering. Uh, but nonetheless, they were stuck with me, and um, so I worked for Shell. Uh, uh, coming out of college, I worked in Bakersfield as a facilities engineer um, in 1992. But at, in my heart, um, I was a movie fan. That's what I love. That's what I, I, I was into in high school. But I had no idea that there was any possibility of a career. I didn't, I didn't want to be an actor. I didn't want to be a director. I didn't want any of that. But I just loved movies. And so I was in Bakersfield, California, going to Shell. Uh, I worked there for two years. And on my way to work, uh, there was this theater. Um, and uh, usually that marquee was vacant. It didn't have any letters on it. Uh, but one day it had uh, the letters for lease upon it. And uh, that was the veritable entrepreneurship light bulb moment. I didn't know I was an entrepreneur, but I saw the for lease and I was like, oh my God, I can lease that. I can show movies for a living. And um, <clears throat> I met these two guys, so that's me with a the tie there, uh, with a pink shirt, and in front of that same theater, and this is Cade and Jennifer Twist, uh, who I, I met at a bar um, a week uh, before, and uh, uh, we talked about, oh my God, I saw for a lease sign, how awesome would it be if we just leased that goddamn theater, and um, so... Uh, by the time, between the time I saw the Furley sign and actually signed that lease was about seven days. 
Um, and I'm 23 years old, and uh, you know, my, my job's up to that point, I was a, I was a paper boy, uh, that the paperboy money funded that computer. I was a bus boy at York Steakhouse. I ran Ethernet cable in college, and then I was an engineer at Shell, and uh, had never taken a business class, much to my chagrin. Um, and then I was a theater owner uh, at the age of 23. And boy, I tell you, like, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of me that. Um, I have mixed feelings about it because I was I was uh, really stupid and really arrogant, that thinking that I could I could do anything and make this happen. But I'm glad that I was uh, because um, I think you 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 weigh what you have at stake, and you know bankruptcy it's, it's not so bad if you don't have a family that's depending on you. So, um, and I think it's it's kind of important, and I, I've actually weighed that many times since. It's like. What is worst case scenario? Just like map that out, understand what it is. If you can live with it, do it, right? So, and so I did it and it was a catastrophic failure. This theater just didn't work, so um, nobody came. We sold everything we, we owned and uh, lived actually behind the screen. Um, and uh, I think our, um, we didn't have any employees. And uh, so Cade and Jennifer, I'm, I'm still friends with Cade today. Cade's turned out to be a, a wonderful um, uh, uh, artist uh, who had a, a show at the Whitney a couple of years ago and a, a documentary about him at, at South by Southwest last year. Um, uh, I don't know what Jennifer's doing, um, but uh, I, I feel like I'm, I'm going off the rails here. But anyway, nonetheless, uh, I, was, I was dating um, uh, a woman named Carrie Smith, uh, she was uh, working at a genetics research factory or, or facility in San Francisco, and I, uh, these guys left after a month into operation at Tejon, and Carrie, um, a, uh, I cried, I believe, and begged her to come down and save the business a month in, and she did, and uh, she's my co-founder at Alamo, which is my, my wife today. We got, we got married a, a year into at, to Tejon, but boy, was it a shit show. Um, uh, so uh, the movies didn't work, but we, uh, we made all the money from uh, live music. It was a thousand seat venue, and we were showing um, uh, esoteric foreign language art films. And we'd usually have between four and 20 people come. We kind of beg for those days when nobody would come so we could go out and like grab a cup of coffee. So this is uh, uh, a show from the Tejon where we had the Ramones come and play. Um, uh, it was on their second to last farewell tour. They had another one after this. Uh, but then, um, I, you guys are, you know, I, oh, if, yeah, it's a mix. Some may know who Montel Jordan is, the, the hit song, This Is How We Do It, for circa 1995. Um, so we had Montel Jordan during the This Is How We Do It days, and uh, uh, it turns out um, it, was a, it, was, it wasn't a very good concert. And uh, he, he didn't have a lot of songs su such that he sang This Is How We Do It, and then for his encore, he sang This Is How We Do It again. Um, <laughs> and uh, after the concert, there was an altercation, uh, sort of some sort of love triangle type of situation, and somebody got shot and was, while he was driving away and wrecked his car into our box office and died. Um, and uh, we were already, it, it was already kind of a not great neighborhood, and that was the front page of the paper, um, with, was that picture, and we couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't move on. And um, so if anybody tells you, like, there's no such thing as bad press, they have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> um, so uh, we closed that theater, and then we moved to Carrie's parents' house in Davis, California, and workshops our next step. And uh, we had learned a lot. We'd learned about business. We'd learned how to run a movie theater. And we had learned that location, location, location mantra. And so we moved to Austin. And so that was uh, 1996. Um, and I apologize, because the next slide has me topless, and it's the only shot I have. It's like, that's me and Carrie. And uh, so we... Um, uh, it was in the 90s, there was a bit of a, 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 a surge in real estate there, and uh, so we found our fifth 
pos our fifth first choice location in downtown LA. So, so we wanted to want to make sure it was in an entertainment district. So we ended up the only location that would give us a lease was a second story building in the warehouse district. Um, um, and this is it. This is us on kind of day one of construction, kind of uh, putting things together and with an extraordinarily limited budget. So we had um, $230,000 and we turned that space into our first Alamo, uh, which included building a kitchen, building restrooms, upgrading the water service. So there's lots of stories here. Uh, there's corners cut and I, you know, I mean, I think the statute of limitations has gone. Law's broken, and we got uh, we got this thing opened. Uh, that's me, fourth seat over. Uh, it's kind of with bad posture, sitting in the seat. So uh, that's that's theater number one. And I'll, I'll, from that, from there, it worked. It worked here in Austin because of the great location, the great community, the great film community that's here. Um, thank God it worked because we had about a month's worth of working capital. Uh, to uh, to pay our staff and um, the the community embraced us relatively quickly and we it, it worked a lot of things happened and then um, I'm going to flash forward to kind of modern times and uh, I'll put a slide of our 38th theater um, which was extraordinarily expensive it was um, it was uh, our San Francisco theater which uh, uh, it was a historic renovation inside and out. It cost us $18 million to, to build this facility. I don't even, I say that word and I don't, I don't even know what it means. Um, uh, but we're, we're a larger company now. Um, uh, but I, I think at our core, we're still the same company. Um, we know a few more things. Uh, and um, uh, we've gotten some great accolades here. Uh, and we've hosted some creepy patrons. Um, uh, but there's things that are true from the early days that are still true today. Um, our intent was to be the best damn cinema that has ever or will ever exist. Um, our, how we're going to do that is uh, ensure every guest has an awesome experience and is excited to come back. And then why do we do it? It's to share the movies we love with as many people as possible. The, the only qualification I had for opening up a movie theater is that I love movies. Uh, I, 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 I adore them, I still do today. And I, I often tell people if, if I stop seeing movies and just get stuck you know, reviewing P&Ls and that's my joy in life, then somebody please just like punch me really hard in the gut and remind me who I am. Um, so we've expanded a little bit um, in our operation. Um, so uh, uh, Alamo Draft, this is like a little, I don't know what this is. It's a graph chart, a visual representation. So Alamo Draft House, the brick and mortar is up at the top, but we have some other facets to the company now. Uh, Mondo is a uh, art, art driven collectibles company. Uh, Birth Movies Death is um, uh, a website uh, for, for movie lovers to talk about movies. Rolling Roadshow is uh, where we get out into the wild and show movies in interesting locations. Um, we started a nonprofit, AGFA, which is um, uh, a, a film archive, and we do a lot of work to train projectionists and preserve film in this digital age. Fantastic Fest is a, uh, a film festival that we put on in September that's the largest what we call genre film festival in the United States. It's horror, science fiction, fantasy, and weird movies from all over the globe with an emphasis on foreign language. And then Neon is our uh, uh, film distribution company. And um, I'm gonna talk about a few of these. I'm gonna talk about our values. Uh, and then I'm gonna open up the questions here. So Neon. Um, so this is our logo. I find it interesting because uh, this logo was designed by the same uh, uh, gentleman that designed the very first sign for the Alamo Draft House and became our logo for Alamo Draft House, who is Austin's premier neon artist. And we had an hour-long conversation about why we wanted to call the distribution company Neon, and he interpreted our words and came up with a sign, uh, which is now our logo today. And honestly, uh, I'm 
extraordinarily proud of this company uh, because uh, sharing the movies with uh, as many people as, as possible is why we have opened up the theater. And uh, we, had, we had an extraordinary success this year with this guy. So uh, we distributed um, Parasite, if anybody has seen it, which I don't know if you heard, but it won a couple Oscars uh, this year. <laughs> and it's kind of like, kind of like rewrote distribution history in a way. And it's the first foreign language film to win Best Picture. It's the first film to win Best Picture and Best Foreign Language, or what they call international now. Um, and we're, we're hoping, uh, if you're a, a nerd about this gentleman, Bong Joon-ho, uh, when he, he won uh, the best international feature at uh, the Golden Globes this year, he said, you know, if you just can get past the one-inch wall, the one-inch barrier uh, of subtitles, there's a whole world of beautiful films waiting for you. And it's something that I believe in wholeheartedly. It's what, kind of why we built the theater in the first place. So. I'm just gonna pause, and this is a, a wonderful human being right there that had a, a wonderful moment uh, about a month ago. Um, I'm bragging now, this is me and my wife, we got to go to the Oscars, it was cool. Um, so, um, if you haven't seen it, I'm gonna take a moment to have with this audience to be a crass promoter. This is the next neon release uh, that's in theaters now called Portrait of a Lady on Fire, and it's extraordinary, and it's beautiful, and uh, you should see it. Um, so, I'm going to awkwardly shift over to our, uh, our core values as a company. Um, no transition, but so be it. Uh, so we have four core values, and it's interesting, the, the process of developing core values as a company, because, you know, I think back to 22 years ago, we're opening up the theater, I don't think I had heard the term core values. And um, we were really just going from our gut. Like our, the idea was open up a theater. And I'm articulating these words because we, we've crafted them in retrospect, right? So, but opening up a theater that we'd want to go to. Uh, but I don't think we articulated those words. Let's like do something cool. Karen, let's just do something cool. Or even not that. I just like, Carrie, I've, I've tried to do something cool and I failed. Can you? Help me. Uh, so, but nonetheless, uh, uh, no, we've, I think we've gone through this process as we've become a bigger company to mature and to um, understand that you have to be, um, uh, uh, you have to be, you, you have to mature in your sensibilities, uh, but you also can't forget why you got into this in the first place. It's a weird dichotomy that, um, I think uh, I'm a neurotic human being, and I think it's good to be neurotic about that. My, my job as a CEO is um, uh, to not forget where we came from and also try to be the best that we can as a, as a business today and pay attention to that darn old P&L. Um, so do the right thing is our, our, our first core value of the four. And I think uh, what I'm going to do now is sort of talk about I'll, I'll, I'll go into tangents about what these mean to me uh, as we execute our, our business. Uh, uh, so do the right thing. A lot of these are, are dorky movie references. Uh, obviously, the Spike Lee uh, incredible movie. If you haven't seen it, do the right thing. But um, but uh, do the right thing. You know, uh, as a part of this community, uh, to your audience and to your uh, your team, to your staff, um, and. Part of this is, um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you some, some iterations. Um, so uh, as we become bigger, a bigger company um, uh, and become more profitable, uh, Carrie and I decided to put together a, um, uh, a charitable fund, a uh, uh, 501c3 nonprofit uh, that can feed kind of our, our interests. And one of those is uh, the the folks that in our community that have had a really tough road, and that's the homeless community in Austin. And so uh, if you don't know Alan Graham, he's kind of a hero of our community, uh, one of the best human beings I know, and uh, has put together a facility like kind of like unlike anything in 
the United States that I've ever seen. It's a, it's a utopia out in East Austin um, that has uh, uh, permanent supportive housing for uh, the chronically homeless. And that type of facility is very hard to put together because if you're near any, any other neighborhoods, they don't want you there. And um, uh, if, I, if I didn't have a, a, a family, if I were eligible to live in Community First, I might do it because it's, it's just a, a, a beautiful space with gardens and uh, uh, wonderful uh, amenities. And, but for 10 years, Alan was not able to get this up. And so he and I kind of brainstormed about how can we make a community asset for the surrounding neighborhoods. And one of those was to build a, a community cinema. Like a, so this is the community cinema out of Community First. And um, uh, they do uh, weekly events out there that are free to the, to the uh, neighborhood. And it's also a source of sustainability for that community that lives at Community First. And um, it's, uh, if you haven't gone out there, I highly recommend doing it. And, and be inspired by uh, some awesome people. Alan Graham is one of the most awesome Austinites I know. Um, uh, we also uh, try to foster community. Um, so that's not just the, the Alamo team, our staff, but it's also, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're a neighborhood theater here in Austin. We want to do what we can uh, to support the neighborhood. Um, uh, so we, a lot of nonprofits, uh, we, we try to work with them to produce fun events utilizing our facilities the best we can. This is an event we did with uh, Austin Classical Guitar Society. So it was an event where uh, folks could come and watch Coco, the Pixar movie, and then we had a hundred guitars for a hundred kids uh, who had never touched a guitar, and by the end of an hour session, those hundred kids could perform the theme song to Coco, kind of uh, introducing them to a, a, a wonderful art form. And uh, we, we try to make other um, events of community gathering uh, and support be a, a, a part of our culture. So we, we support R Ronald McDonald House, uh, uh, Mobile Oats and Fishes. We do um, a lot of other events as, as a group from Alamo. Um, and I'm, then I'm going to like dig in. Um, I can look from my timer here. I've got nine minutes before I was supposed to switch it over to questions. But Boldly Go, which um, uh, is, is clearly in copyright infringement uh, territory. Uh, but that's not the Starship Enterprise there. It's just a generic, uh, generic spaceship. Uh, but this is one that really resonates with me. And so I've got a, a lot more slides here. This is, this is where I lean in the, the boldly go territory. So uh, one thing we've, we started up years and years ago was taking the cinema outside into uh, uh, unique and very memorable experiences. So we've, we've done Close Encounters at uh, Devil's Tower. And for, for years, uh, for the, really the past seven years, I think we've done this special screening out at Lake Travis. We've done it in other arenas, too, uh, where it's Jaws on the water, um, where you may or may not, if you haven't been, you may or may not know that you have a one in 10 chance of, we have a scuba rescue team that's underwater, just making sure for safety's sake. But they're bored because it's really safe. Um, uh, so they have radios on, and whenever there's a shark attack, they will just mess with people's feet uh, <laughs> under the water. <laughs> and that's why they keep coming back year after year. Uh, and so we try to do these experiential moments of famous movies in famous settings all across the globe. We've shown uh, Escape from Alcatraz on Alcatraz. We've done the Sergio Leone Spaghetti Westerns, uh, where they were shot in Almeria, Spain. Um, it's, it's, it's a really fun facet of the business. Um, and then um, uh, this is something I just kind of threw this slide in. I, I, we haven't shown this, but it's, uh, it's in development. So you guys are the first people to, to know. Um, we used to have, we used to build really large lobbies because we didn't have reserved seating and people would just queue up. We'd have like a thousand seats to be sitting and we'd have 500 people in the lobby waiting in line for half an hour to get the right seat. And uh, so that doesn't happen because we have reserved seating. So uh, at uh, Slaughter is the first one of these we're doing. It's um, 
this co it's, it's a concept we're calling My Own Private Alamo. So we're building this little 12 seat theaters with extraordinary presentation where the idea is you just, you rent the whole thing. It's your, it's your own theater. Um, and um, it's such that with, via your phone, you'll be able to pause the movie if we can get the, the studios to say, yeah, that's a cool idea. We're trying. They said no first. But, uh, but the idea, but uh, our, our no talking policy doesn't apply in here. If you want to talk or yell or do whatever the hell you want to do, fine. It's yours. You've rented this private cinema. But on opening night of Star Wars, you could watch it with your closest 12 friends because this is like theater number nine of Slaughter. So that should be open in July. Please don't put it online because uh, I haven't told anybody but you. Um, um, and then I, you know, I have a, I have a collecting, some would call it maybe an addiction or a problem, uh, but um, this is uh, something we've been, we've been doing and we've got, this is, our, this is the first one we've done, we have three more that are happening. So a unique collection, uh, and we've built this concept that's a, we always want to have a bar associated with the bar, with the theater so that people can watch a movie, then grab a drink if you want to grab a drink and talk about the movie. That's one of the, my favorite things is to like have a deep conversation about the movie I've just seen. So this is a collection that I found from Germany uh, called Castan's Panopticum. Um, and it was a wax museum. And so interestingly, in the history of cinema, um, movie theaters put the wax museums out of business. Uh, if you ever saw The Greatest Showman, uh, uh, you see that, that was his first business uh, before he got into the circus was a wax museum in Manhattan. And so it was air conditioned and people would go see like crazy, exploitive, weird dioramas and you'd take the whole family. And so this is one of the last ones that's still intact and so we bought it and turned it into a, a bar and it sort of, I felt like it was enough that you could make the segue into movie history. Like this was where some of the marketing techniques were first established. And so it's a bar museum. Um, it's a relative boldly go idea that, that works. It's, it's, it become, it's, in, it's in Brooklyn, our New York theater. And we have a couple others. So there's some, these are actual uh, death masks of famous people. Uh, so that uh, in the middle there, far right, is Napoleon's death mask. So there was actually a plaster cast of Napoleon. That wax was, was sculpted from that. There's Wagner up above him, uh, Beethoven below. And um, uh, then there's some, we have the largest collection of wax genitals in America. <laughs> right there. If you're ever in Brooklyn, come and see. Uh, uh, Video Vortex is, uh, this is, we've done four of these um, concepts. Uh, as you, uh, you know, uh, may know, uh, the, the video store is not really a healthy industry these days. And so as video stores close, we have bought uh, some of the legendary video stores uh, in America and made the collection available for free. So like a free rental. And my concept is, is that um, uh, you know, we already have the real estate, we have the internet, we have the staff from the ticket counter. All, we just have to buy the video collection and, and make it for free. We can charge late fees so people don't steal from us. And uh, it works out great. And so if, uh, if you are subscribers of Netflix, how, how many people actually pay for Netflix out of curiosity? pay, actually like legitimately pay. Okay, interesting. All right. Um, so Netflix uh, has a sum total currently on their, uh, on their service of about 500 movies before the year 1982. Uh, this video vortex has 52,000 movies uh, before the year 1982. Uh, this collection is, uh, and this is again not public, this is the Vulcan North collection that uh, they closed down, and we all, we've also uh, uh, taken on La Video and uh, some uh, iconic video stores from New York. Um, and it's wonderful, and so it's, it becomes the anchor of the bar, and it's also services the idea of for movie lovers by movie lovers. And we put it, you know, stupid VHS beer menus, and uh, have compressed a collection of, of 70,000 movies into a very tight configuration with these three-tiered, tight uh, uh, display cabinets. 
and we also have built these weirdo, we also uh, rent VHS and VHS players, also called VCRs. Um, uh, so, uh, and this is a, I don't know, I'm, I'm derailing here, let's just, uh, so this is the next one. This is, uh, again, I told you I was, a, 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 I had a collecting problem. So this is a concept that hasn't launched yet. It's gonna be opening up in Manhattan. It's called the Press Room. And um, I came across, it was at South by Southwest actually three years ago, I saw a short called The Collection about an Omaha couple who had uh, purchased a collection of 60,000 metal letterpress plates, the basically movie ad plates that you used, to, you used to put in the newspapers from 1930 to 1982 when they stopped doing it that way and became electronic. And it's basically a history of movie advertisement from that incredible period. And um, so I told them I wanted to build this museum bar and I gave them a price and then they laughed off my offer. Uh, and then two and a half years ago, about six months ago, uh, they said, hey, we've had this collection now for a long time. Nobody's given us, uh, they went on Antiques Roadshow and they got appraised for 15 million bucks. And I can guarantee you my price was not that. And, uh, but they're 75 years old. They're like, you know what? We like your idea. We don't like your price but we're gonna sell it to you. So I bought this whole collection and we're turning it into the next museum bar uh, where we'll have live printing with an old 1930s press where you can take the plate from Citizen Kane, make some note cards, and you can see, witness this collection of history of movie advertising uh, in the bar. Um, here's like, uh, I like that movie, Shogun Assassin, so I went ahead and printed that myself for some note cards for friends. Um, uh, and uh, so I'm 45 seconds over time, uh, but I'm reaching the end. Uh, I was told to also talk about Season Pass. Um, season Pass is an innovation uh, built upon Movie Pass that you know, came and went. Um, when Movie Pass introduced their $10 their price, the, our industry was petrified. We were excited. And we eventually went, we immediately went to work to develop our own. So that's what it is. It's basically 20 bucks for unlimited movies. And um, it's in full scope, like it's, it's live in all of our theaters. It's our, one of our biggest campaigns that we're running. Um, interestingly, it just drives frequency. People, when you have committed to this uh, $20 a month for unlimited movies, you come more. So you come 50% more. Uh, you really don't spend that much less, it's about 50 cents less each time. Um, so that helps us pay for these free movie tickets. Uh, and then a lot of times you see a movie like Parasite, it's like, oh my God, let's, I'm gonna take you to see Parasite. Uh, uh, mine's free, you gotta pay. Uh, and so they bring, they bring companions uh, for a second or third viewing. And then oddly enough, a lot of our subscribers, let's say half, have not done the basic math. Um, and that um, you really, so the price, the, 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 the service is priced out such that it's a little bit less than two movies a month. Um, so if you're watching 10 movies or less, you should, I won't say it, but, uh, <laughs> but what, what happens is the people that watch 10 movies a month, like they actually move to watching 20 movies a month, so it's an extraordinary, it's the whole subscription economy, it's all the rage with kids these days. <laughs> and uh, we love it, and it's our, it's our big focus. And our last core value, which I'm gonna just blaze through this really fast, is, is give a shit. And that's what we, we expect, we expect people to love what we're trying to do, be engaged, and do their best work for us. Um, and I'm gonna give a couple examples, it's the, the the quote unquote products category of Mondo uh, that uh, does just extraordinary work. We, we reimagine the movie poster um, without the crass commercial idea of having to sell a movie and just like what is the most beautiful piece that we can do out of it. Um, we've segued into making movie themed board games, uh, movie themed uh, tiki mugs, uh, and movie themed uh, soundtracks movie thing puzzles uh, and more. Uh, but it's, it's driven by passion and love of the, the, what we're working on. And um, the, the, the last thing is uh, we've started a, a nonprofit, the American Genre Film Archive, 
Um, so if you go into a normal projection room for another theater, it's like a laboratory. It's very Spartan. You can see down in that hallway, you can see that thing with the silver tube. That's a ventilation tube for, that's a projector. Normally you see nothing in the projector. In our booths, you see crusty old 35 millimeter film in shelves that really strains the structural integrity of our buildings because they're very heavy. Um, and so we've uh, taken my sort of collecting obsession, turned it into a nonprofit. Uh, we loan out more films than the Academy of Motion Picture Arts uh, does every year. Uh, we also host a, uh, a training seminar where we train anybody that wants to, to the art of projecting 35 millimeter film. And there's, um, uh, it's, a, it's, we're in a, um, we're in a society, uh, America's pretty shitty about archiving its history. And uh, if you go back to the silent era, 90% uh, of the movies from the silent era are gone forever. Uh, you, you know um, the Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, and the, like the big guns, but you don't know the vast majority of it. The sadder story is that from the 1960s, there's about 35%, 40% of the movies from the 1960s are gone forever. Uh, and then we're also entering this age where, um, you know, people uh, shit on VHS. Uh, uh, we're seeing that culture of movies that were only available on VHS um, are deteriorating at a fast clip. And so the American Genre Film Archive tries to, any time, time there's film in peril, we archive it, uh, we restore it, uh, we scan it, and we make it available to anybody that, that needs it. And so we've, not only on 35 millimeter film, but we're trying to, uh, our goal is to digitize a thousand of the rarest VHS uh, films um, that are fragile and, and put out on a, a terrible, terrible in terms of restoration format. Uh, and, and pre, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a magnetic tape that's very fragile. Um, so that's, the, that's the, the, the process of AGFA. And last slide is the worst graphically designed slide. I just kind of threw it in there. Uh, it, it sort of speaks to our love of movies. So we have 41 locations. We have an uh, average number of eight screens per location, but yet we, we, sh we screen over 2,000 films a year, and you can see how the rest of the industry compares to us, and I, I think that speaks to our, our love of film, and our, I think maybe also our love of weird. Uh, and that's, that's it. I, I just, uh, just it. <clears throat> almost on time. All right. So thank you again for joining us. That was interesting. I learned a lot <laughs> about the film industry that I didn't previously know. Um, to start the Q&A portion, as you mentioned when you started, Wired has called Alamo Draft House the coolest movie theater in the world. Entertainment Weekly has called Alamo Draft House the number one theater in America. <laughs> when did you realize that what you built was a winner? What was that moment for you? Uh, a winner. I mean, I could tell you, like, speaking back to the early days, um, the day number one sold out, had this crazy, beautiful um, moment. Day number two, we showed um, Absolute Power, which is a, not a very good Clint Eastwood movie, uh, and there were three people in the audience. <laughs> and again, I, I, I mentioned that we didn't have any working capital to kind of guide us through that. Um, and about three weeks in, uh, Anne Hornaday, who was the chief film critic at the Austin American Statesman at the time, wrote a nice article about us. And at that same weekend, we um, released uh, uh, Austin Powers. And everybody came and everybody wanted to see that movie. So I thank Austin Powers. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I like it. And Anne Hornaday. <laughs> So, you know, you had the experience of starting the one um, theater and, and then that not working out and moving to Austin. What was your biggest fear starting Alamo Draft House? Oh, man, I had a lot of fears. <laughs> um, inexperience, you know. So we had run a movie theater in Bakersfield, and we felt like we had the basics of that down. It was a step up to run a restaurant in a movie theater. And so um, screwing that up was the big fear. So 
my wife took a job as a waitress at the Red Lion um, uh, Hotel doing the breakfast shift and she photocopied all the like manuals there. <laughs> and then uh, I got a job on, near, on, on um, uh, 24th Street at uh, Double Dave's Pizza and learned how to make pizza. And uh, I worked there for 10 days and photocopied all the manuals. And, uh, <laughs> and that was it. And uh, so our fear was that maybe that wasn't enough. <laughs> sure, you could see it. Yeah. What was the best piece of advice you were given in starting Alamo Draft House? Uh, piece of advice. Um, I don't, that's a really difficult question. I don't know if I got any good advice. I mean, most of the advice was don't do it. Uh, <laughs> my parents and you know Carrie's parents and uh, um, I don't know I got a lot of encouragement from uh, from friends and uh, associates that uh, I think what they saw is we were following our passion and um, uh, I like I really like entrepreneurship at a young age mm -hmm. because I, I like um, that this you know that bankruptcy is not that bad right you can you know this this country is structured so that it can support like you got to go for it and do it and believe in what you have and uh, if you if you're enthusiastic about it and able to able to face worst case scenario as not being that awful bad I, I'm I don't, I don't like to say, um, you know, uh, be overly optimistic, right? I think you should be overly pessimistic um, and just be comfortable with abject failure. And if that doesn't sound so bad, then just go for it, you know? Uh, it'd be much harder for me to be entrepreneurial now that I've got two kids and I've got obligations and it's very, it's very selfish at that point. So young entrepreneurship, I think, is great. Wonderful. So you touched on briefly um, Netflix. Um, so this is from the audience. Do you think movie theaters and streaming will ever intersect? And then also, how has streaming impacted Alamo Draft House? I mean, I think we're already intersecting. So Netflix is a big partner of ours. So uh, uh, there's a lot of the, the cinema industry that is anti-streaming and wants to preserve in the olden days, there was this hard, fast 90-day window where movies would come out in theaters, you have 90 days exclusive in theaters, and then it comes out on streaming platform or whatever. There was no streaming platforms back then. It comes out on home video, right? But I think what that built was kind of a lazy, on-your-heels industry. Um, and uh, I, like, I like being in the position of saying, I have to justify my role as a marketing partner to anybody who has paid millions of dollars to create content for movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found a great relationship with Netflix. So um, we made a, a great partnership with the Taylor Swift documentary that people wanted to be with other Taylor Swift fans in a theater, despite the fact that they could watch it for free at home. Uh, or, you know, The Irishman. And so it's like we pick and choose the movies from the Netflix arsenal that we think are going to work for us and we work together to boost the profile of it. Um, so, and statistically, people that watch a lot of movies on streaming platforms watch more movies in theaters. And, you know, I'm not in competition with, with Netflix. Like, I'm in competition with things you do outside of the home, right? Like, no matter, you know, you don't stop going to restaurants because you have a great new stove, right? Uh, you, you know, like, uh, people, no matter how good the entertainment value is from streaming platforms, you want to go out and experience something out of the home with your friends or with, in an interesting environment. And so I, I compete against roller skating, live music, uh, uh, bars, restaurants, and uh, I want it's it's my duty to make sure going to the cinema is worth the money of, and the time to doing it. So you also compete against other theaters trying to now sort of imitate this model, right, of, of menus and, mm -hmm. 
and um, you know, eating a meal while you're watching your movie. How do you continue to differentiate yourself from all of those models that are now popping up more frequently? Um, I should probably acknowledge that uh, I am an imitator myself, that I stole some of our ideas. Uh, Carrie and I, when we got married in the middle of the Tejon era, our honeymoon was to go spy on this company called McMinimins uh, Cinemas in Portland that had beer and food and movies. Super romantic honeymoon. So, uh, uh, and I'm kind of a all ships rise kind of guy. Like I'll take inspiration if I see somebody doing something better than me, I'll try to steal it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, I, I like to uh, get out and exp so yeah. I just want to I want to compete and do it better. And I'm not gonna. I don't I don't mind that there's more people doing what we were doing then because I'm a thief myself. <laughs> Great. Um, and you, you touched on the movie Parasite, which mm -hmm. was very successful. What do you think made that movie so unique and successful? <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's crazy. It's, um, we're four days away from it being the uh, third most successful foreign language film of all time. So it'll just be... Um, uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and um, uh, the guy, I forgot the other one, the, uh, yeah, that other one. Um, um, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a beautiful movie. Um, it's, uh, possibly it's from our brilliant marketing campaign. Um, I, 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 I can't explain it really, I think um, it, it resonated with audiences. It's a total package of funny, uh, had a, a social conscience. Um, it was exciting. It's just a great movie. Mm -hmm. And it's exciting to me that it has transcended the language barrier, the um, foreign you know, country barrier, um, because I'm, I've been a longtime fan of global cinema, if you will, and I, I, I can't explain that. I can tell you this, like, so we bought that movie at script stage, um, so we bought it after the script. Um, our high-end projection for it was to get nominated for foreign language and to gross over $5 million. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's grossed $52.5 million and obviously won a couple more awards than that. So... Uh, I don't know, I'm as, I'm as confused as you are, but I, I'm really happy about it. You know? Great. So you started um, out as an engineer oh. um, and did that for two years. How did you sort of learn entrepreneurship business concepts while you were building these businesses that you worked on? I don't know. Um, uh, classes would have been good. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like uh, when we hired our first like cinema professional, like maybe it was 14 years into business, it was, I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> that, well, that's how you do it. <laughs> uh, it's in terms of building, uh, building facilities. Um, uh, we read a lot of books. Um, we both from, like we did a lot of the early construction ourselves. So okay. we just kind of tried to self-educate. Sure. Um, but geez, we made a lot of mistakes. Um, so uh, it's not, I think uh, whoever's in school here for business related activities, that's a good idea. You should probably do that. <laughs> it's like accelerate the process. We probably could have gotten to where we are now a lot faster <laughs> if we had had proper education. So, but it was just, you know, we were going with our, our passion. We worked really, really, really hard. I think. Um, uh, yeah, we worked every single day. Right. Uh, we woke up, we went to work until we couldn't, we weren't awake anymore, and then we went to bed. So it's an unhealthy, it was, we were unhealthy in the early days. Um, uh, but we're also young, and I think you're more resilient when you're young. 
So. Sure, sure. Well, it worked out for you. Yeah. You've been very successful. Um, you talked about the expansion of Alamo Draft House and all of the different areas that you're in now. It's not just a Texas gem or an, or an Austin gem anymore. So what is your process like for deciding where your brand should go next and how do you decide it's the right time to take Alamo Draft House to a new location? Um, it's, a, it's a mix of data and, and gut in terms of new locations. I have, I have certain indices that I lean on, so uh, we, we, we'll find a site, and uh, I, have, I have target cities that we're, we're looking at, and that's in part um, in service of, of things like Neon and like what's the footprint for expanding, um, supporting independent film. Uh, so we'll look at the data. Number one piece of data is... Um, like two factors are average household income and um, uh, education. Like uh, you know, how many you know, is it how many people in that household have had a college education? Because that really indicates that they're interested in um, the movies that we want to support. Um, and then uh, I'll I'll take all this like data and heat maps, and then I'll go out to the to the market um, and. I'll go on like a Tuesday night and I'll go on a Friday night and see what the, what the uh, neighborhood feels like. Um, I'll also, um, I, like to, I like to find markets that are like Austin a while ago where they're emerging. So you get deeper demographic data. I like to look at uh, the number of residential remodel permits have been pulled in the last trailing 12 months. I think it's kind of an interesting one. I also like to look at per capita breweries. Uh, um, you know, I, do, do people drink interesting <laughs> beer? Or is it a Coors Light kind of town? <laughs> so, you know, it's not, this is where I'm like deviating from science a little bit, but it's still science-based. But it still works for you. Yeah. yeah. And, and then does it, does it feel right? You know, are people out on a Tuesday night going to see stuff and entertainment? So, um, and then sometimes we're wrong. Some, a lot of times we're right, but uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an imprecise science. Absolutely. So our last two questions to wrap up <coughs> the event are movie focused. Okay. So the first one is, let's say Hollywood comes calling and they want to make a movie about the life of Tim Lee. Who would play you in that movie? <laughs> oh man, then I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Rick Moranis? I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know. What's uh, um, uh, Peter Lorre, but he's dead. Um, yeah, you know, that's fine. I, yeah, pass. Is there another question? Uh, sure. I'm not what is, answer that for what is your favorite movie? Oh, so it's interesting uh, because uh, um, that's a question. It has a little resonance within a few of us at, at Alamo. Like if we're hiring, if we're trying to like interview people for a job, um, and, uh, and this is a bit a tell, if you're ever hiring for a job at Alamo, there's, it's not everybody, but there's some of us, if, uh, this, if we're totally done with this candidate and we don't want to, we want to end the interview and it's a group interview, we'll ask the question, what's your favorite movie? Which seems <laughs> innocuous, which means I'm done. I don't want to talk to this person anymore. They're not going to get this job and I want to get back to my work. Um, so... <laughs> I shouldn't, I shouldn't telegraph that. <laughs> I didn't know that before I asked this question. So. Uh, I, the, the other funny thing about this is uh, our legendary director in Austin, uh, Rick Linklater, you know, you, you get asked that question a lot if you're in the industry. Um, if you go back, if you were to, like, dig into YouTube and find all the times where Rick's been asked that question, he's answered 34 different ways. So he'll just... You know, whatever he's feeling like, because he likes a lot of movies. Um, if you had to pick one, I know, but I'm just stalling because today, I don't have a great answer. The way you're I, feeling today. I will tell you that the answer I've answered most, I've taken a little okay. inspiration from, from Rick, and I've answered this differently uh, over the years. Uh, but this is my genuine an answer. Okay. Is uh, when I got into this business, I. Um, uh, I mentioned before that I was stupid and arrogant, and I had no understanding of silent film. And so I don't think I'd actually watched a silent film all the way through. 
and I've just seen like clips of things and had this chip on my shoulder that's, ah, these are silly. Um, and in Bakersfield, we got in touch with uh, a, a film community there. They wanted to do a, some silent film screenings and we showed um, uh, Buster Keaton's The General and Charlie Chaplin's City Lights. And I can tell you that those are the two most significant moments of watching a movie in a theater where my mind was shattered mm -hmm. because um, everything I had preconceived uh, was wrong and that the, the language of comedy had been written in the 20s and has not evolved that much. And those are two extraordinarily brilliant films. And yeah, they reinforced for me how stupid I was. <laughs> but I love them, I love them very much, yeah. Well, thank you once again for joining us this evening. Can we get another round of applause? <laughs> And thank all of you for coming out this evening. We will be hosting a reception um, in the atrium as you exit. We hope you will stay and enjoy a movie-themed refreshment <laughs> um, with us. And thanks again for coming out, and have a great evening, everyone. Thanks,